on behalf of the Park University Ethnic Voices Poetry Series. I want to welcome you all here tonight. Our series is beginning its sixth year, which I can hardly uh, believe, and we definitely want to thank the Missouri Arts Council for its continued uh, support of our series. And I found as director one of the perks of a series like this is all the wonderful people uh, that I have met along the way, uh, that are of like mind, share the value of poetry, uh, that I have come to call uh, my friends and also collaborators. Uh, this, of course, includes our good friends here at the Kansas City Public Library and also the University of Missouri at Kansas City radio program, New Letters on the Air, and its interviewer, Angela Elam. And the three of us are coming together this year uh, to all present the three poets in our new series. And I hope that you'll pick up a flyer on your way out on the table out there that will tell you about uh, our next two poets as well. And during that six years in uh, hosting about uh, 40 poets uh, here, Angela has interviewed a great many of those poets. And tonight, um, in a little while, we'll all get to be part of the audience and listen to her interview our first poet for the 2013-2014 uh, series season tonight. Uh, we are delighted and so honored to welcome Martina Spada back to Kansas City. He is called the Latino poet of his generation and has published more than 15 books as a poet, editor, essayist, and translator. His latest collection of poems, The Trouble Ball, is the recipient of the Milt Kessler Award, a Massachusetts Book Award, and an International Latino Book Award. The Republic of Poetry, a collection published in 2006, received the Patterson Award for Sustained Literary Achievement and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. A previous book of poems, Imagine the Angels of Bread, won an American Book Award and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Other books of poems include A Mayan Astronomer in Hell's Kitchen, City of Coughing and Dead Radiators, and Rebellion is the Circle of a Lover's Hands. He has received other recognition, including the Robert Creeley Award, the National Hispanic Cultural Center Literary Award, and the Penn Revson Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. His work has been widely translated. Collections have been published in Spain, Puerto Rico, and Chile. A former tenant lawyer, Espada is a professor in the Department of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So please join me in welcoming Martin Espada. Buenas noches. I'm very glad to be back in Kansas City. Uh, I believe it's been eight years since the last visit. Um, Angela and I calculated that. Um, and it's good to see some familiar faces, um, some old friends. You're probably wondering why I sent my skinny older brother in my place. Um, anyway, we're going to combine formats this evening. Um, I'm going to be doing a reading uh, mostly from my most recent collection, The Trouble Ball, uh, but uh, a couple of other poems from uh, previous collections as well. Um, and then um, the second part of the evening uh, will feature my onstage interview with Angela Elam. Uh, and I believe this is our third interview, and I wish I could do an interview with her every week. Um, <laughs> so um, that's where we will uh, go this evening, and we will finish up with the book signing uh, in the outer antechamber. First, however, uh, I would like to begin with a poem from uh, my collection, Alabanza. That's my selected poems. Um, and uh, this is a poem uh, that will take us somewhere else, uh, particularly will take us to the island of Puerto Rico. That's where my father was born and where my roots are, historically. Um, this is a poem about the music of Puerto Rico, particularly the music brought by the slaves from West Africa with their religion, 
which survived every attempt by the Spanish to stamp it out and is now an essential part of Puerto Rican identity and culture. If you go to Puerto Rico, if you go to Viejo San Juan, the old city, you'll find a street there called San Sebastián, St. Sebastian Street, uh, which is famous for its music. There's a big festival there, and all year long you can hear this music coming um, from the bars and the uh, clubs and the street itself, and much of it music that came originally with the slaves and their religion um, from West Africa. So for me, San Sebastián is a street of miracles, a street where the impossible can happen, uh, even the end of war and the return of the dead. Um, there's a very simple Spanish refrain in this poem, in La Calle San Sebastián, on St. Sebastian Street. So I hope you can hear the music and the words. And this is where we will begin uh, this evening. In La Calle San Sebastián, Viejo San Juan, Puerto Rico. Here in a bar on the street of the saint in La Calle San Sebastián, a dancer in white with a red, red scarf in La Calle San Sebastián calls to the gods who were freed by slaves in La Calle San Sebastián. And his bronze face is a lantern of sweat in La Calle San Sebastián. And hands smack congas like flies in the field in La Calle San Sebastián. And remember the beat of packing crates in La Calle San Sebastián from the days when overseers banished the drum in La Calle San Sebastián. And trumpets screech like parrots of gold in La Calle San Sebastián. Trumpets that herald the end of the war in La Calle San Sebastián. As soldiers toss rifles on cobblestone in La Calle San Sebastián. And the saint himself snaps an arrow in half in La Calle San Sebastián. Then lost grandfathers and fathers appear in La Calle San Sebastián. Fingers tugging my steel wool beard in La Calle San Sebastián whispering, your beard is gray, in La Calle San Sebastián, spilling their rum across the table, in La Calle San Sebastián. Two cousins lead them away to bed, in La Calle San Sebastián. And the dancer in white with the face of bronze, in La Calle San Sebastián, shakes rain from his hair like the god of storms, in La Calle San Sebastián and sings for the blood that drums in the chest in La Calle San Sebastián, and praises the blood that beats in the hands in La Calle San Sebastián, and La Calle San Sebastián. <laughs> uh, as I am fond of saying, I am uh, originally from the tropical paradise of Brooklyn, New York. And I grew up uh, in the East New York section of Brooklyn, the Linden Projects, and that's where I met my first poet. And his name was Jack Agueros. And Jack Agueros, not only a poet, uh, but a playwright and uh, a translator and an essayist and a community organizer and the director of El Museo del Barrio, the only Puerto Rican museum in the mainland United States at that time. Um, Jack uh, developed Alzheimer's a few years ago, and uh, a group of us got together uh, to organize a benefit for him um, in the community where he was born and raised in East Harlem. Uh, and I wrote this poem for the occasion. Uh, it's called, Blessed Be the Truth Tellers for Jack Agueros. In the projects of Brooklyn, everyone lies. My mother used to say, if somebody starts a fight, just walk away. Then somebody would smack the back of my head and dance around me in a circle, laughing. When I was 12, pus bubbled on my tonsils, and everyone said, after the operation, you can have all the ice cream you want. <laughs> I bragged about the deal. No longer would I chase the ice cream truck down the street, panting at the bells to catch Johnny, the ice cream man, who allegedly sold heroin the color of vanilla from the same window. <laughs> then Jack, the truth teller, visited the projects. Jack, who herded real camels and sheep through the snow of East Harlem every three king's day. Jack, who wrote sonnets of the jail cell and the racetrack and the boxing ring. Jack, 
who crossed his arms in a hunger strike until the mayor hired more Puerto Ricans. And Jack said, you're going to get your tassels out? Ay, bendito, cuchi frito, Puerto Rico. That's going to hurt. <laughs> I was etherized, then woke up on the ward, heaving black water onto white sheets. A man poking through his hospital gown leaned over me and sneered. You think you got it tough? Look at this, and showed me the cauliflower tumor behind his ear. I heaved up black water again. The ice cream burned. Vanilla was a snowball spiked with bits of glass. My throat was red as a tunnel on fire after the head-on collision of two gasoline trucks. <laughs> this is how I learned to trust the poets and shepherds of East Harlem. <laughs> Blessed be the truth tellers, for they shall have all the ice cream they want. <laughs> Jack um, is one of many fathers I have had. And in that spirit, I now turn to a poem uh, about my uh, actual father, Frank Espada. Uh, this is the title poem of the new collection, The Trouble Ball, uh, and it's fitting for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the World Series is upon us. Uh, I come to you from um, a foreign country called Massachusetts where I have lived for many years, so uh, I have been converted. I am a Red Sox fan. <laughs> and we are about to go up against the formidable St. Louis Cardinals. Um, and I can't let this pass. I like the Cardinals particularly because there are three Puerto Ricans in the starting lineup. <laughs> yes. Anyway, um, I learned my love of baseball from my father. He learned it from his father. Um, my father, Frank Espada, was born in Boal, Puerto Rico in the year 1930. Uh, and he grew up watching baseball on the island with his father. Uh, now, uh, baseball on the island of Puerto Rico in the 1930s featured um, the stars of the old Negro League who were not permitted to play in the major leagues at that time due to strict policies of segregation, but were welcomed as heroes throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, Puerto Rico included, and none more so than Satchel Paige, the great African-American pitcher. Um, and Satchel Paige, of course, pitched in this very city for a number of years, but he also pitched on the island of Puerto Rico uh, he even married a Puerto Rican woman. Um, and he was my father's favorite player. Now, my father took the boat with his family to this country in 1941. And one of the first things that he did was to go and see a ball game at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, New York. Now, the year was 1941. We tend to associate the Brooklyn Dodgers with all things progressive because of Jackie Robinson, who broke the color line and integrated Major League Baseball, but keep in mind that did not happen until 1947. Six years before, Brooklyn, the Dodgers, Ebbets Field, just as segregated as anywhere else where they played Major League Baseball. So that's the setting for this baseball biography of my father and Satchel Paige and I make an appearance towards the end. Um, the trouble ball, parenthetically, refers to Satchel Paige's changeup, an off-speed pitch. But you'll hear in this poem that trouble refers to many things, uh, especially the great American trouble of race. So this is the trouble ball from my father, Frank Espada.
In 1941, my father saw his first big league ball game at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, the Dodgers and the Cardinals. My father took his father's hand. When the umpires lumbered on the field, the band in the stands with a bass drum and trombone struck up a chorus of three blind mice. The peanut vendor shook a cowbell and hollered. The home team raced across the diamond, and 30,000 people shouted all at once as if an army of liberation rolled down Bedford Avenue. My father shouted, too. He wanted to see the trouble ball. On my father's island, there were hurricanes and tuberculosis, dissidents in jail, and baseball. The loudspeakers boomed, Satchel Paige pitching for the Brujos of Guayama. From the Negro Leagues, he brought the gifts of Balthasar the King. From a bench on the plaza, he told the secrets of a thousand pitches. The trouble ball, the triple curve, the bat dodger, the midnight creeper, the slow gin fizz, the thoughtful stuff. Pancho Coimbre hit rainmakers for the Leones of Ponce. Satchel sat the outfielders in the grass to play poker, windmill three pitches to the plate, and Pancho spun around three times. He couldn't hit the trouble ball. At Ebbets Field, the first pitch echoed in the mitt of Mickey Owen, the catcher for the Dodgers who never let the ball escape his glove. A boy off the boat. My father shelled peanuts, waiting for Satchel Page to steer his gold Cadillac from the bullpen to the mound, just as he would navigate the streets of Guayama. Yet Satchel never tipped his cap that day. ¿Dónde están los negros? asked the boy. Where are the Negro players? No los dejan, his father softly said. They don't let them play here. Mickey Owen would never have to dive for the trouble ball. It was then that the only brown boy at Ebbets Field felt himself levitate above the grandstand and the diamond, another banner at the ball game. From up high, he could see that everyone was white, and their whiteness was impossible, like snow in Puerto Rico and just as silent. So he could not hear the cowbell or the trombone or the Dodger fans howling with glee at the bases loaded double. He understood why his father whispered in Spanish. Everybody in the stands might overhear the secret of the trouble ball. At Ebbets Field in 1941, the Dodgers met the Yankees in the World Series. Mickey Owen dropped the third strike with two outs in the ninth inning of game four, flailing like a lobster in the grip of a laughing fisherman, and the Yankees stamped their spikes across the plate to win. Brooklyn, the borough of churches, prayed for his fumbling soul. This was the reason statues of the virgin leaked tears, and the fathers of Brooklyn drank not the banishment of Satchel Page, the double headers in Bismarck, North Dakota. There were no rosaries or boiler makers for the trouble ball. My father would return to baseball on 108th Street. He pitched for the Crusaders, kicking high like Satchel, riding the team bus painted with four-leaf clovers, seasick all the way to Hackensack or the Brooklyn Parade Grounds. One day, he jammed his wrist, sliding into second, threw three more innings anyway, and never pitched again. He would return to Ebbets Field to court my mother. The same year they were married, a waiter refused to serve them, a mixed couple sitting all night in the corner to my father hoisted him by his lapels and the waiter's feet dangled in the air, a puppet and his furious puppeteer. My father was familiar with the trouble ball. I was born in Brooklyn in 1957 when the Dodgers packed their duffel bags and left the city. A wrecking ball swung an uppercut into the face of Ebbets Field. 
I heard the stories, how my mother, lost in the circles and diamonds of her scorecard, never saw Jackie Robinson accelerate down the line to steal home. I wore my father's glove until the day I laid it down to lap the water from the fountain in the park. By the time I raised my head, it was gone, like Ebbets Field. I walked slowly home. I had to tell my father I would never learn to catch a trouble ball. There was a sign below the scoreboard at Ebbets Field. Abe Stark, Brooklyn's leading clothier. Hit sign, win suit. Some people see that sign in dreams. They speak of ballparks as cathedrals, frame the pennants from the game where it began, Dodger blue and cardinal red, and gaze upon the wall. My father, who remembers everything, remembers nothing of that dazzling day but this. Donde están los negros? No los dejan. His hair is white, and still the words are there, like the ghostly imprint of stitches on the forehead from a pitch that got away. It is forever 1941. It was the trouble ball. <laughs> now, uh, I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that my father was uh, merely content to educate me in uh, terms of baseball. Uh, he went beyond, and even though he himself had never been to college, it was my father who actually gave me my first book of poems. He gave me some other questionable reading material, too. <laughs> um, and that is the source of uh, the following poem, also in the same collection, The Trouble Ball. Um, this poem is called The Playboy Calendar and the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. The year I graduated from high school, my father gave me a Playboy calendar and the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. On the calendar, he wrote, enjoy the scenery. <laughs> In the book of poems, he wrote, I introduce you to an old friend. The Beast was my only friend in high school, a wrestler who crushed the coach's nose with his elbow, fractured the fingers of all his teammates, could drink half a dozen vanilla milkshakes, and signed up with the Marines because his father was a Marine. I showed the Playboy calendar to the Beast, and he howled like a silverback gorilla trying to impress an expedition of anthropologists. I howled too, smitten with the blonde called Miss January, held high in my simian hand. Yet, alone at night, I memorized the poet astronomer of Persia, his saints and sages bickering about eternity, his angel looming in the tavern door with a jug of wine, his battered caravan serai of sultans fading into the dark. At 17, the laws of privacy have been revoked by the authorities, and the secret police are everywhere. I learned to hide Kajam and his beard inside the folds of the Playboy calendar. <laughs> in case anyone opened the door without knocking, my brother with a baseball mitt or a beery beast. I last saw the beast that summer at the marine base in Virginia called Quantico. He rubbed his shaven head, and the sunburn made the stitches from the car crash years ago stand out like tiny crosses in the field of his face. I last saw the Playboy calendar in December of that year when it could no longer tell me the week or the month. <laughs> I last saw Omar Khayyam this morning. Awake! He said, for morning in the bowl of night has flung the stone that puts the stars to flight. Awake, he said, and I awoke. <laughs> 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 
Actually, it was here in Kansas City that I heard uh, a tale of a doctor uh, who had literally collected thousands of editions of the Ruby out of Omar Khayyam. And this started me collecting them too. Uh, I think I have a dozen now. I got a way to go, but um, I was inspired by this doctor I never met. And he was inspired by the same poet my father helped me to discover. Of course, not all poets are equally good or kind or generous or truthful. Uh, not all poets are Omar Khayyam. We have also the case of Ezra Pound. Now, um, I've heard many debates about Ezra Pound, noted poet and fascist. Um, and that's not something I'm saying about him that he wouldn't have said about himself. He was a proud, self-proclaimed fascist. And these debates tend to be very abstract. They tend to be very uh, uh, cerebral. And then one day I met a man for whom this was all too real. His name was Abe Osharoff. And he was part of something called the Lincoln Brigade. Um, 3,000 volunteers in this country who signed up and went to fight against Franco and the fascists during the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s. And uh, all of this came together for me when I brought my old friend, Abe, to um, a conference of poets uh, in Boston, and there was a big debate at this panel about Ezra Pound, and then Abe finally put his hand up and settled the debate emphatically once and for all. So here's the poem that came out of it. Um, and this is called, How to Read Ezra Pound. At the Poets Panel, after an hour of poets debating Ezra Pound, Abe, the Lincoln veteran, remembering the Spanish Civil War, raised his hand and said, if I knew that a fascist was a great poet, I'd shoot him anyway. <laughs> I have never heard a more emphatic ending to an argument in my life. All these poets looking at their shoes. Time for lunch. <laughs> but what happens when um, the good guys lose? Abe was fond of saying, we fought the good fight and we lost. What happens when fascism wins? Well, all you have to do is look no farther than the example of Chile. Um, my, poem, my book, The Republic of Poetry, um, includes a cycle of 12 poems about Chile. I wrote these poems uh, after having the opportunity to visit Chile in July of 2004. I was part of a small U.S. delegation that went over there to participate in the Pablo Neruda centenary. Pablo Neruda would have been 100 years old um, in July of 2004. Uh, and one of the highlights of my visit was to uh, go to uh, Neruda's famous house, La Isla Negra, uh, one of the most famous writer's houses in the world. Uh, and of course, Neruda was not there to greet us. Uh, he had died in September of 1973, not long after the military coup in that country. Um, that coup took place on September the 11th, 1973, the first 9-11. And we just marked the 40th anniversary of that coup. Um, I should say by we, I mean the world, because it was little noted in this country. Even though it was the Nixon administration, uh, and Henry Kissinger in particular, uh, who engineered uh, that coup, ushering in a dictatorship of 17 years under General Augusto Pinochet. Um, when I visited the house of Neruda, I found myself in his bedroom, looking out through his picture window at the sea and the rocks and his garden. And I remembered a story 
uh, told by the great writer Ariel Dorfman and others about an incident that took place there right after the coup, which shortly before Neruda's death, one last confrontation between the military and the poet and the political the human values they represented. This is the poem that came out of it, which is in my collection, The Republic of Poetry. Uh, this poem is called The Soldiers in the Garden, Isla Negra, Chile, September 1973. After the coup, the soldiers appeared in Neruda's garden one night, raising lanterns to interrogate the trees, cursing at the rocks that tripped them. From the bedroom window that could have been the conquistadores of drowned galleons back from the sea to finish plundering the coast. The poet was dying. Cancer flashed through his body and left him rolling in the bed to kill the flames. Still, when the lieutenant stormed upstairs, Neruda faced him and said, there is only one danger for you here, poetry. <laughs> the lieutenant brought his helmet to his chest, apologized to Senor Neruda, and squeezed himself back down the stairs. The lanterns dissolved one by one from the trees. For 30 years, we have been searching for another incantation to make the soldiers vanish from the garden. And so now, what are the dangers that face us today? Well, my feeling is that the greatest uh, civil rights struggle of our time in this country, in fact, the greatest human rights struggle of our time in this country, is the struggle over immigrants and immigration. And um, in the most recent book, The Trouble Ball, there are several poems addressing this issue. I'm going to finish with two poems um, that address this issue uh, in particular. Um, uh, this next poem is uh, based on something that actually happened in my life some 30 years ago. And for many years, I couldn't even talk about it, much less uh, write about it. But I felt uh, under the circumstances in the environment we face today that I had to tell the tale um, and humanize um, immigrants uh, through poetry uh, as they continue to be dehumanized all around us uh, and not by coincidence during another economic downturn. Um, there's a little bit of Spanish in this poem. Uh, the word corrido refers to a Mexican ballad, um, narrative song. Um, the phrase quiero ver las fotos means I want to see the pictures. And uh, I refer also, also to Zapata, Emiliano Zapata, uh, the leader of the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Um, he came from the state of Morelos, uh, and the subject of this poem came from that same state. Um, the poem is called Isabel's Corrido, and it's dedicated to Isabel. Francisca said, marry my sister so she can stay in the country. I had nothing else to do. I was 23 and always cold, skidding in cigarette coupon boots from lamppost to lamppost through January in Wisconsin. Francisca and Isabel washed bed sheets at the hotel, sweating in the humidity of the laundry room conspiring in Spanish. I met her the next day. Isabel was 19, from a village where the elders spoke the language of the Aztecs. She would smile whenever the ice pellets of English clattered around her head. When the justice of the peace said, you may kiss the bride, our lips brushed for the first and only time. The borrowed ring was too small, jammed into my knuckle. There were snapshots of the wedding and champagne in plastic cups. Francisca said, 
the snapshots will be proof for immigration. We heard rumors of the interview. They would ask me the color of her underwear. They would ask her who rode on top. We invented answers and rehearsed our lines. We flipped through immigration forms at the kitchen table the way other couples shuffle cards for gin rummy. After every hand, I'd deal again. Isabel would say, Quiero ver las fotos. She wanted to see the pictures of a wedding that happened but did not happen, her face inexplicably happy, me hoisting a green bottle dizzy after half a cup of champagne. Francisca said, she can sing corridos, songs of love and revolution from the land of Zapata. All night, Isabel sang corridos in a barroom where no one understood a word. I was the bouncer and her husband, so I hushed the squabbling drunks who blinked like tortoises in the sun. Her boyfriend and his beer cans never understood why she married me. Once he kicked the front door down and the blast shook the house as if a hand grenade detonated in the hallway. When the cops arrived, I was the translator, watching the sergeant, watching her, the inscrutable squaw from every western he had ever seen, bare feet and long black hair. We lived behind a broken door. We lived in a city hidden from the city. When her headaches began, no one called a doctor. When she disappeared for days, no one called the police. When we rehearsed the questions for immigration, Isabel would squint and smile. Quiero ver las fotos, she would say. The interview was canceled, like a play on opening night shut down when the actors are too drunk to take the stage. After she left, I found her crayon drawing of a bluebird tacked to the bedroom wall. I left too, and did not think of Isabel again until the night Francisca called to say, your wife is dead. Something was growing in her brain. I imagined my wife, who was not my wife, who never slept beside me, sleeping in the ground, wondered if my name was carved into the cross above her head, no epitaph and no corrido, another ghost in a riot of ghosts evaporating from the skin of dead Mexicans who staggered for days without water through the desert. Thirty years ago, a girl from the land of Zapata kissed me once on the lips and died with my name nailed to hers like a broken door. I kept a snapshot of the wedding. Yesterday, it washed ashore on my desk. There was a conspiracy to commit a crime. This is my confession. I'd do it again. And uh, I'll finish my reading, the first portion of this program, uh, with uh, the title poem of, from uh, Alabanza, which also has to do with immigrants and immigration, but in a very different way. We have just, of course, uh, marked another uh, anniversary of 9-11, the 9-11 that happened in this country. Uh, and it becomes more and more of a patriotic commemoration every year, more and more of a militarized commemoration every year. And um, while all of that is going on, we must try to remember what happened that day as it was, and remember, for example, that immigrants died that day too. Um, many of them in one restaurant, uh, called Windows on the World. Um, and this poem is dedicated to them. Uh, invisible in life, even more invisible in death. That's why I wrote the poem. Um, the word alabanza means praise in Spanish. And um, 
The title of this poem also refers to the labor union uh, to which these workers belonged. Um, that title is Alabanza in praise of Local 100. For the 43 members of hotel employees and restaurant employees, Local 100, working at the Windows on the World restaurant who lost their lives in the attack on the World Trade Center. And I'll finish my reading with this. Alabanza. Praise the cook with a shaven head and a tattoo on his shoulder that said, Oye. A blue-eyed Puerto Rican with people from Fajardo, the harbor of pirates centuries ago. Praise the lighthouse in Fajardo, candle glimmering white to worship the dark saint of the sea. Alabanza. Praise the cook's yellow pirate's cap worn in the name of Roberto Clemente, his plane that flamed into the ocean loaded with cans for Nicaragua, for all the mouths chewing the ash of earthquakes. Alabanza. Praise the kitchen radio, dial clicked even before the dial on the oven so that music and Spanish rose before bread. Praise the bread. Alabanza. Praise Manhattan from 107 flights up, like Atlantis glimpsed through the windows of an ancient aquarium. Praise the great windows where immigrants from the kitchen could squint and almost see their world. Hear the chant of nations, Ecuador, Mexico, Republic Dominicana, Haiti, Yemen, Ghana, Bangladesh, Alavanza. Praise the kitchen in the morning where the gas burned blue on every stove and exhaust fans fired their diminutive propellers. Hands cracked eggs with quick thumbs or sliced open cartons to build an altar of cans. Alabanza. Praise the busboy's music, the chime, chime of his dishes and silverware in the tub. Alabanza. Praise the dish dog, the dishwasher who worked that morning because another dishwasher could not stop coughing or because he needed overtime to pile the sacks of rice and beans for a family floating away on some Caribbean island plagued by frogs. Alavanza. Praise the waitress who heard the radio in the kitchen and sang to herself about a man gone. Alabanza. After the thunder, wilder than thunder. After the shudder, deep in the glass of the great windows. After the radio stopped singing like a tree full of terrified frogs, after night burst the dam of day and flooded the kitchen. For a time, the stoves glowed in darkness, like the lighthouse in Fajardo, like a cook's soul. Soul, I say, even if the dead cannot tell us about the bristles of God's beard, because God has no face. Soul, I say, to name the smoke beings flung in constellations across the night sky of this city and cities to come. Alabanza, I say, even if God has no face. Alabanza. When the war began, from Manhattan and Kabul too, constellations of smoke rose and drifted to each other, mingling in icy air. And one said with an Afghan tongue, teach me to dance, we have no music here. And the other said with a Spanish tongue, I will teach you, music is all we have. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Try to follow that up. <laughs>
That was fabulous. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. There is so much to talk about in that. Let's begin with music, because I know that's been a big influence in your life. And when you hear a poem like that last one, by the way, we recorded that poem, I think eight years ago, Alabanza, and you read it so differently now than you did then. And it has a very musical quality about it. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between poetry and music for you? Well, um, uh, I certainly can. I, I have been influenced by music uh, in my poetry, to be sure. I'm not musically trained. Um, sometimes people say to me, oh, you must sing. And I say, no, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. Um, but I chant. And um, the chanting, in turn, um, in an alabanza, but in, in many other poems, is predicated on an aphora. Um, you know, that, that repetition which enables me uh, to um, construct my own form. Uh, I don't write in form, usually. I mean, there's a sonnet that pops out of me every now and then. Um, even when I do write in form, I tend to disobey many of the rules. But I do oftentimes create my own form, and uh, I use anaphora to do it. So I get structure from that and also musicality from that. Um, and whereas in alabanza you hear the repetition of that key word, um, there are other poems where there are different forms of repetition uh, at work. In the trouble ball, for example, I'm using a very similar device called epistrophe. Instead of uh, sorry, apostrophe. Apostrophe. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, an aphora involves a repetition of uh, initial phrases, phrases, uh, words uh, at the beginning of, of a phrase. Um, but epistrophe involves repetition of words at the end of, of the phrase. Okay. And in the trouble ball, I, I use that phrase um, over and over again at the end of each uh, eight-line stanza. So the, rep the repetition in there has almost like a refrain quality to it. Yes. Which goes on with song. You know, I was thinking some about the trouble ball, what struck me about this book, um, which I believe is out there, your most recent book, more so than any of the others that you've written, has a very elegiac quality to it because you're celebrating the lives of a lot of people who have meant something to you over the years. Um, why, why so much of that in this book? Uh, because my friends are dying. I have reached that age. I am now 56 years old. Uh, and uh, people of my generation will appreciate this. Uh, once you hit 50, your friends start dropping left and right. And sometimes it's through illness. Uh, sometimes it's self-inflicted. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. Um, and I'm not only referring to people of my own generation, but to my friends who were uh, elder to me. Um, this particular book is dedicated to a number of people who have died. Uh, one of them, for example, was Howard Zinn, the great historian. Um, an activist, and uh, I've, I've had uh, historically many friends who were you know, 20 and 30 years older than, than myself, and, and they keep crossing me up by dying. Um, and, uh, you know, poets are, are very much like um, uh, preachers in the sense that when someone dies, we're called upon to make some sense of it and to console others. Um, publicly. So I was called upon within a few years to uh, uh, deliver some words of wisdom at one memorial service after another. And after a while, uh, the, uh, taking the same approach felt very much like ramming my head into the wall. I mean, you can write an elegy, but what does that really mean? What does it really mean to make sense 
of, of something like death that appears to be so meaningless, uh, to try to console people when it comes to the inconsolable. Uh, because I know uh, I can't be consoled. Uh, the poems that I've written for these friends uh, do not allay the grief. They don't expel it. Uh, but perhaps I can be of some service to somebody else dealing with the, the same experience or even the loss of the same individual. What I found myself doing in this collection, though, is instead of simply writing the same full-on elegy that I had written before, was varying from that pattern uh, somewhat in that I tried to find the moment in an individual's life that started that individual down the path to become whoever it was we loved. You know, and, and in the case of uh, uh, Abe Osharoff, for example, um, uh, the uh, uh, friend of mine who actually uh, volunteered with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and went off to fight against fascism in the 1930s, uh, this was a man who was an activist for more than 70 years. Um, and when he died, um, what I ended up doing is writing a poem about the moment when he decided that he was going to dedicate his life to being an activist. And he was, he was all of 15 years old, and it involved um, uh, preventing an eviction uh, as part of the anti-eviction movement in New York uh, City in the 1930s, and confronting a police officer who would end up arresting him at the age of 15. He knew from that point onward that he would be a Bosharov. He would become this person that we would, uh, we would love and who would inspire us for decades to come. And he's the heart of the poem that you read, How to Read Ezra Pound, so that yes. you know that. Yeah. Yes. And Abe had a wicked sense of humor. I, you know, again, this sort of uh, defies the usual stereotype of the uh, sour-faced, politically correct activist. Uh, Abe, Abe was very, very funny, and that's, you know, there's a good example of it. Uh, but I can remember all sorts of things he would say. Uh, Abe had a great big white beard. And uh, one time we were sitting together having lunch, and a little girl, she couldn't have been more than four or five, came up to us, and she looked at him with big eyes and said, are you a lion? <laughs> and he looked down at her and said, yes. <laughs> Didn't miss a beat. <laughs> well, I think that's what I, uh, I like so much about what you do in the Trouble Ball, is that it, it is a celebration of people who have passed on. I mean, it's got all these hard facts in it, but you, you also have such a sense of humor, even in some of these very heavy issues that you deal with, with the people related to them. I also believe in elegies for the living. Um, one of the things I learned in writing elegies for the dead is it's too late for them to hear it. And so uh, in the case of the poem for Jack Agueros, Blessed Be the Truth Tellers, uh, I wrote that poem just as his mind began to slip past the point where he would not recognize uh, the events in the poem or the, the poet who wrote it for him. Uh, and at this point, uh, Jack's uh, Alzheimer's is advanced. He's the first person I have known, uh, I've been close to, with this dreaded, devastating disease that still hasn't received adequate attention. Um, and uh, I made a point of uh, visiting Jack at his home uh, after this book came out. Uh, I brought him the book, I read him the poem, I signed it for him, I handed it to him, and then, to my amazement and my horror, he held the book as if he did not understand what the object was. Um, it was simply a, a, a rectangle to him. Um, this is why we have to write elegies for the living um, while their bodies and their minds are still with us. Yeah. 
That is so true. And that's the poem, Blessed Be the Truth Tellers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a beautiful and, work. And the night that I read that poem, he cheered me on. He was uh, very vocal. Uh, and a, a bunch of his friends had a chance to get together and thank him. Well, we could. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing. And he's a wonderful writer. His books are still out there. And I urge people to go and find them. Uh, his poetry and his short fiction. Uh, I wrote a, a forward to a book of his called Correspondence Between the Stone Haulers with Hanging Loose Press. And Curbstone Press published a collection of short stories called Dominoes uh, from Jack Agueros. Curbstone Press uh, has a history of publishing lots of wonderful writers. And I noticed that you have a poem in here dedicated to the publisher of Curbstone Press, who died, was that four or five years ago? How, how long ago did he die? I oh. lost time. Yeah, uh, uh, we're referring, of course, to uh, Alexander Sandy Taylor, uh, who died uh, in 2007. And um, the Curbstone Press, unfortunately, no longer exists as such. It's been uh, absorbed into Northwestern University Press. The books are still available. I, I was about to say, um, at least the books are still available, yes, the so that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, Northwestern has, has kept the inventory going and, and alive, um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, Sandy was another one of those uh, fathers I've collected. Um, he was a, a great friend and mentor uh, to me, but to, to many uh, many poets. And um, a year after he died, less than a year, um, I got um, a phone call from his wife, Judy, Do Judy Doyle, who's the co-publisher of Curbstone. And she had an unusual request. Um, and so uh, that's what this poem is about, um, the poem to which you refer. Uh, the setting is Willimantic, Connecticut. A working class town used to be known as uh, Thread City for the thread mills there. Uh, and one of the things that Sandy did uh, was to establish a poet's park there in Willimantic, named after Julia de Burgos, the wonderful Puerto Rican poet. Um, and that's, uh, that is the, indeed the setting for the, the action in this poem. And it's called, without a trace of hyperbole, the day we buried you in the park for Sandy Taylor, there is an epigraph. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles, Walt Whitman. The day we buried you in the park, I couldn't say no. Your wife had a plan revealed on the phone with the hush of conspiracy. There are laws in this city against the interment of human remains in public spaces. This was the poet's park, your vision, floating like the black butterflies of cinders over the house in ruins across the street. You and Juan saw the stone steps flowing down into the circle where the poets would stand and sing one day. You and Juan saw the poets showering the air with words and the trees drinking words like water. You nailed up the sign and spread your arms to greet us at the ceremony. This could not be explained to the clerk who stamps the licenses for the burial of the dead. Juan began to cry when he saw your ashes in the wheelbarrow. I shook him by the shoulder. The neighbor who watches the park from her window was eyeing us. I handed him the shovel. We had to clamp our jaws like mobsters, stoically soiling their hands with the grit of a rival thug. Your wife poured a bag of plant food over your ashes in case the neighbor peeked too long through the hedges or the cops rolled their cruiser to a stop, bored after years of shoving drunks into the back seat. We stirred the ashes with our hands till they turned white at the wrist and what I'd heard was true. There is bone that will not burn, bodies that refuse to become dust, the stubborn shards of a man. Ask any criminal who labors to bury the evidence. We weren't 
criminals. We dug the hole in the wrong place, ripped out the roots, grunted with every shovel full of rocks. We made the little grave too big, then tossed away the dirt, forgetting that we'd need to fill the hole once we dumped you in it. When I tipped the wheelbarrow, your ashes landed with a puff, drifting in the briefest of clouds over the grass, and Juan dropped to his knees, crying again, giving us away. The neighbor poked her head from the window like a chicken suspicious of the world beyond the coop. An hour after we began, I wore a mask of ash and sweat, black shoes white, like the last man in the village to hear the warning of volcano, or a miner on the first day back at work after the strike is lost, or a believer smeared with his ancestors about to wash in the great river. A woman who recognized my face stopped me as I crossed the street. Did you just bury something in the park? She asked. Why would I do a thing like that? I said. The day we buried you in the park, I drove home with three scoops of your ashes in a coffee can, chock full of nuts, the heavenly coffee, their slogan emblazoned in a cloud across the New York skyline. At your desk, there was bad coffee and good poetry, but no heaven. So I will look for you under my boot soles, walking through the world, soaking up the ghosts wherever I may go. That's wonderful. So what a great tribute. And what, I mean, the way you describe things, like the woman like a chicken peering out from her Coop. I mean, I just love how you come up with things like that. I, w I was thinking about the poem, The Playboy Calendar in the Rubaiyat of Omar, and you had that line, and the sunburn made the stitches from the car crash years ago stand out like tiny crosses in the field of his face. I mean, do you, when you're in the process of writing, are these images that you've maybe taken notes of somewhere or does it come up just to you when you are in the moment of writing that poem? Uh, well, I think in metaphors and similes. So uh, it's a very natural vocabulary for me. Um, I do have the capacity to uh, retain what I see and what I hear, hold it there, and then find the words and hold the words there for as long as it takes before I have the opportunity to set them down on the page or the screen. Um, so it's really memory functioning on those two levels. I remember what happened, I remember what I saw and what I heard, uh, what I tasted, touched, smelled, but I also remember the words themselves. They stick in my head and if I'm, I'm lucky I have an opportunity to set them down before too long. Uh, I don't remember as much as I used to. Yeah, I think we're all like that. <laughs> but I'm amazed. So you don't really take notes. It comes, you commit it to memory, and then when you sit down in the act of writing, it comes back to you. No, I don't take notes. And uh, there are times when I will recognize the situation immediately as being the stuff of poetry. Uh, and other times it'll take me years and years before I realized that, well, yes, that, that indeed is the stuff of poetry. Uh, what I think it's important uh, to, to keep in mind is that our lives and the lives around us do indeed constitute the stuff of poetry. Poetry is not something that happens on Mount Olympus. It's not something that happens to the gods. It's not hap something that happens to the astronauts, or to somebody in outer space, to somebody else. Uh, poetry is around us all the time if only we are able to recognize it for what it is. So true. That is true. You know, poets often use I, but it's not necessarily themselves. I mean, the, that is the I in a poem. But I have to ask, out of your poem about Isabel, is that I, you, being the person? I mean, did you? I. I don't like to ask those questions very often, but marry somebody to help them be in this country? Yes, that's me. Uh, I did it. Um, 
And you do it again. And I do it again. <laughs> um, and oddly enough, in, in the poem, I am confessing to a crime, and I use that phrase ironically at the end of the poem because I am referring to a far greater crime, uh, which is the crime uh, uh, of our mistreatment, our abuse uh, and, uh, of, of immigrants in this country. Um, it should be noted that this administration has set a record in terms of the number of deportations, the number of people being thrown bodily along with their dreams back across the border. And not only is this devastating to them, it is particularly devastating um, to their family. Um, we tend to forget uh, that when deportations happen, families are broken up. Um, and uh, there's another poem in the, in the Trouble Ball where I refer to that. There's a found poem in the book um, uh, based on an email newsletter I received from the Mesilla Cultural Center in Mesilla, New Mexico. Um, and um, it's all about the breakup of families. I may, it's very short. I may as well, I may as well read it. Um, and I think of this whenever I hear politicians crowing about the sanctity of the family, usually in response to uh, gay marriage and usually in opposition to it. Uh, and I'm amazed at their deep concern uh, for the sanctity of the family when it means preventing uh, gay and lesbian people who love each other from getting married. But then these same politicians don't seem to give a damn when uh, their immigration policies uh, tear immigrant families in half. Um, this is the poem uh, to which I'm referring uh, in the Trouble Ball. And uh, it's called, Mr. and Mrs. Rodriguez have been deported, leaving six children behind with the neighbors. Please donate shoes to this family, care of the Mesilla Cultural Center. Rodriguez family shoe sizes. Marina, age 17, size 6. Rocio, age 15, size 5. Memo, age 13, size 7. Jesus, age 12, size 7. Jose, age 8, size 4. Ana, age 5, size 3. That's Martina Spada reading from the Trouble Ball. Here on New Letters on the Air, we're downtown at the library, at the Kansas City Public Library. And, um, you know, it's obvious, I, I don't know how many people in the audience know this, but Martine used to be a tenant lawyer and would really speak out for people in the courtroom. And you've taken that now and put it in your poetry. You're still speaking out, but through your books of poetry. Is it as satisfying? It must be, or you wouldn't keep doing it that way. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure I would refer to my life as a lawyer as satisfying. <laughs> um, okay. It was a different kind of, of, of battle. Uh, what poetry and the law, of course, have in common for me is that they both involve advocacy speaking on behalf of those who do not have the opportunity to speak for themselves. Not that they couldn't speak for themselves, given the chance, they just don't get it. They don't get a chance to uh, travel the country and do readings uh, or uh, uh, speak uh, to an audience on the radio. Um, and, and certainly, the imposition of silence is, is one of the ways in which the society represses whole classes of people. Um, and mind you, I didn't invent advocacy and poetry. This is part of a literary tradition that goes back in this country to the middle of the 19th century and Walt Whitman. Um, it was Whitman who spoke out in number 24 of Song of Myself uh, for what he called the rights of them the others are down upon. Um, and uh, Whitman's influence is vast. It runs both north and south. And so Whitman's greatest disciple was indeed Pablo Neruda of Chile. And it was Neruda who stood at the heights of Machu Picchu um, in, in Canto 12 
and essentially said the same thing. He said, I come to speak for your dead mouths. And so I take uh, my cues from them, and I consider myself a poet grounded in the tradition of Whitman and Neruda, but so many others, too. I think of Langston Hughes or, or Carl Sandburg or Edgar Lee Masters. Um, I think of the Beats. Uh, I think of Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I think of contemporary poets like Marge Piercy um, or Carolyn Fourche, all of them, um, and many Puerto Rican poets as well, like Jack Agueros uh, in this country, or Clemente Soto Vélez in Puerto Rico, uh, Juan Antonio Correjer, Julio de Burgos, all part of that tradition of advocacy and poetry. Yes. And you can discover a lot of that in his book, The Trouble Ball. You know, I really appreciate this. He puts notes in the back of his books that help introduce you to the people that he's referring to, the other writers, the poets. And uh, before I get the evil eye from the people at the library, I know we've run out of time. Normally, I would ask you for questions, but I think we're over time, and I know some of you would like to purchase his book and talk to him out there. Oh, and I should add, by the way, uh, because this will encourage you to purchase the book, um, and this is also very helpful for the radio audience, the person on the cover of the book is my father. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Frank Espada, uh, in this photograph, and again, this is the benefit of, uh, of those in the radio audience. He is 17 years old. He is rearing back to fire a fastball uh, with his high leg kick in the style of his favorite pitcher, Satchel Paige. Um, and that brings us back, of course, to the title poem, The Trouble Ball. Um, now, if you look closely at the cover, um, for reasons I will not explain, because we have run out of time. For whatever reason, there's no baseball in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even noticed that. Yeah, That's he, hilarious. He explained it to me. I'm not sure I believe him. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, my father is still around. He uh, will turn uh, 83 this year. Uh, and... Uh, uh, he's a tough critic, but I know he likes that poem. <laughs> and it, we have to say, too, that one of his early, earliest books it was a collaboration with your father because you had some of his photographs with your poetry, right? Yes, so. yes. My father, uh, is, uh, again, not, not only an athlete, as the poem describes, um, but um, himself, a community organizer, uh, uh, very much a part of the civil rights movement, uh, in fact, he was arrested and thrown in jail in Biloxi, Mississippi for not going to the back of the bus in December of 1949, only two years after that photograph was taken. Um, so my father served uh, uh, as an ethical example, but also an artistic example, because he became a documentary photographer. Um, and uh, the director of something called the Puerto Rican Diaspora Documentary Project, a photo documentary and oral history of the Puerto Rican migration uh, across the United States and even back to the island of Puerto Rico. So there's more influence. I've actually been influenced by some people who aren't even poets. <laughs> and he's at the heart of the title poem, The Trouble Ball. So thank you all for coming. I hope you will pick up uh, his Martina Spada's book and uh, we appreciate you being here. And I'd like to also thank the library and um, the people who work with me, Jamie Walsh and Stephanie Hughes and everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.